It's a joy to be here with you today, church family. If you're new or visiting, I want to welcome you today. My name is Joshua Kirstein. Privileged to be the preaching pastor here at Disciples Church, and um, the Lord is good and at work in many ways through the ups and downs of life. And however you found your way to be with us today, it's great to have you here. Um, we're in, in our 134th year of gospel ministry here in Bakersfield. The, long-standing roots to the very beginning of the city and enjoying this new location that we're in the last few years and God doing amazing things to grow our church and, and um, see that happening today uh, all around, and families and marriages. and um, So we're excited to know you better and walk with you. Um, if you can grab your Bibles with me this morning and turn to the very back of your Bible and find the letter of First John if you need a Bible, we have some in the back of the room there on the bookshelf. You're welcome to grab that to use during the service. There's blank sermon notes back there if you're a note taker as well. And uh, we're enjoying this sermon series through the letters of John as we look at his emphasis of truth and certainty and love. Um, and as you turn there to 1 John chapter 5, uh, I just want to say it's a privilege to to know you, church, and to walk with you, to grow in the Lord together, um, to know his truths and see them transform us in the power of the Holy Spirit and the work of Christ. Um, I'm also very thankful this morning, waking up in God's gracious work in my own life, um, especially in his providence, that I would become one in marriage with my wife Jennifer 23 years ago today. Um, May 15th, 1999, and uh, a special day it was. The smiles on her face say it well. Um, to, to become one for the glory of the Lord, for the testimony of what God intends marriage to be. I'm thankful for my wife's pursuit of Christ, his gracious work in us. And you all, your role in that, your support, your prayer, your walking with us uh, and uh, encouraging our marriage and looking to know the Lord and grow yourselves in all that he's called that to be uh, for his glory. So uh, may he continue that work in all of us. So excited to take some days off this week and get some time with her and enjoy that. Um, no place I'd rather be than with you on Sunday morning to look to God's good word together. So let's do that. First John chapter 5. And we're going to look at verse 2 and 3 today. We'll have some scriptures on the screen to help you follow along, but encourage you to have your Bibles there and and dig in with me this morning. Our passage, 1 John 5, 2-3. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. Once again, John says, we know. When John says, we know, he's talking to fellow Christians in this letter, we need to see he wants his Christian brethren to have confidence in these mighty truths about who we are in Christ and who we are in God. I mean, the very writing of these letters are John's effort to reassure the brethren who are the beloved children of the faith, to reassure them, to help ground them, to have real certainty of what is true, certainty and confidence of who we are in Christ. And in this, John seeks to safeguard his Christian blood-bought family against any kind of spiritual amnesia. We need this too, church. We need it all the time. It's why our regular study of the Word and being faithful to hear the Word taught faithfully is, is so important for us. We need God's Word. We need the truths of God to reorient our thinking, to combat the plethora of deception and that's all around. It's all around. Our own flesh. The spirits at war with the flesh is our realities that we face every day. We need to remember, we need to be reminded that we're no longer enslaved to sin. We need to be reminded that we now belong to Christ, that we're secure in him, that we're saved, we're part of God's eternal family as a result of his substitutional atonement in our place, God's grace to save us. We didn't deserve it. 
So I want to I want to not fly past past this this morning. I want to take a second and really help us ground ourselves. As you think back years from now on this sermon series through the letters of John, and especially this first letter, I want you to remember where in Scripture you are reminded of certainty in your faith that you belong to Christ. And so take a quick tour with me. I'll put them on the screen. We're going to go pretty quick. The train's going to have some speed. I just want to run through the letter in all the times so far that John has said, we know. So just Soak this up with me for a moment. First John chapter 2, going back to chapter 2, verse 3. By this, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. First John chapter 2, 5 through 6. By this, we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Chapter 2, verse 13. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, children, because you know the Father. It says this again in verse 14. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. Verse 21 of chapter 2. I write to you, not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. You know the truth. And because no lie is of the truth. Verse 29 of chapter 2. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. In chapter 3, verse 2, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, just because we shall see him as he is. Verse 5 of chapter 3, You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. Verse 14 of chapter 3, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Verse 16, chapter 3, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. In verse 19 of chapter 3, by this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. In chapter 24 of In in verse 24 of chapter 3, whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. In chapter 4, verse 6, we are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. In verse 13 of chapter 4, By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. In verse 16 of chapter 4, by, So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. And our verse now today, 1 John chapter 5, verse 2, By this we know that we love the children of God. Christian, you need to know. You need to be confident in who you are in Christ. This is a great gift to us. We live in a very uncertain world. But in Christ, you have been given certainty. And we need to, we need to grab hold of that confidence that we have in Christ alone. For those of you who stand outside of Christ, Lord of your own life still, considering Scripture, considering the church today, you you don't know any kind of certainty. There is no promises. There, There is no guarantee. There is only certainty in Christ, in God. We had no hope outside of Christ, church. For anything lasting apart from Christ. We had no hope for God. This was our sad, it was our sobering position before salvation. And it remains the truly sad and sobering position of all who remain outside of Christ. And so I just want to ask you, brethren, do you have confidence? 
Not in yourself. Not, not even in others around you. But in God. I want you to know confidence that you belong to God. That you're His. That you're secure. I want you to know truth in a sea of lies, in a world of deception. And in that, that confidence, that knowing is a, is a sure foundation under your feet in the midst of all that we face. See John's love for his brothers and sisters in Christ. See him saying, we know. So let's look at what God wants us to be certain of in today's passage. By this we know that we love the children of God. First, we have to understand it is impossible to love the children of God if we do not love God. And it's also impossible to love God if you do not love the children of God. They're inseparable, according to Scripture. John made this clear just a few verses ago. We don't have to go far to see this. First John 4.20 If anyone says, I love God, but hates his brother, is a liar. He who does not Love his brother whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he's not seen. Brother, sister in Christ, we're talking about the family of God here. You must do business with us this morning. You cannot proclaim to have a deep, abiding, growing love for God and then not have a true and deep love for the brethren, for the body, for his blood-bought people, your eternal family, your eternal brothers and sisters in Christ. So this is why so much of Scripture says make every effort for the unity, to keep the unity Christ has purchased for us to have. He broke down the dividing walls that had us separate by economy and the streets we grew up on, uh, ethnicity and, and, and experience and all of that. He broke it down that we are a diverse people, a beautifully a beautiful mosaic that God has made the church. And he's given us a unity and we are to fight for it. That love of God at work in us must be at work for each other. You cannot love God and not truly and fully love his people. And if you have business to do there, then you need to do it, Christian. You need to confess of sin and repent and pick up the phone and call for a meeting or Overlook an offense, truly don't harbor it or forgive as you've been forgiven so that there's nothing between us. This is important. Genuine love for the brethren. By this we know that we love the children of God. We must be confident in this church. We must know that we are born again. So John is using the love for the brethren as an evidence that I am indeed born again, as we talked about last week in verse 1, here in verse 2. So it is an important way that we would consider how we're doing in our walk, in our testimony, genuinely as the Lord's instructed us. So on top of this, John is going to speak to now He's going to remind us of the love we are to have for God and each other. And he's going to speak now to another layer, another evidence that we truly belong to God, and that is that we now obey his commands in the way we didn't before we belonged to him. Look with me, our whole passage without the end. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commands. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. We know that we're born again, that we love his children when we love God and obey his commands. And again, as John does in his letter, he's a good teacher, he's circling back to this. He's already stated this in different ways in the letter. I'll remind you of a couple. First, first John chapter 2, verse 3 John said earlier in the letter, By this we know that we have come to know him. How do we know? If we keep his commandments. 
is super simple, and yet it's often a very ignored foundation of the Christian faith. And we got to do business with that today. Because we're talking about a, an evidence that God says is non-negotiable. This is, if you belong to me, this is who you are, this is what you'll do. And yet, so it's simple, and yet still so many today believe that someone can know God, be saved, and yet live in unrepentant sin, can actively continue disobeying God's commands because they think it's better or whatever that might be. If we are truly born again, if we truly love God, the evidence of that, according to Scripture, as we'll see according to Christ himself, is that we obey his commands, commandments. I say it's not difficult to grasp because when we do this different in any other category of life, it's quickly understood to be hypocrisy. And let me explain. If you say you love your spouse, but then you live in a constant state of selfishness, of discord, of disregard for God's design for your role in the marriage, what he intends it to be, then do you really love your spouse? If you say you're committed to getting healthy, but you continue to eat junk food in extra large portions, are you really committed to getting healthy? If your kids say they love you, mom and dad, but then they're just constantly in a state of disobeying you, do they really love you when God's word makes it clear that they are to obey you? It is just simply not true love if it's not backed up with the way we live our lives. We can say anything, but what, what is it real? It is hypocrisy to say that you've died to self, now joyfully belong to Christ, but then you reject Christ's authority over your life. To reject His good commands over your life. Like I told you, he's mentioned this in multiple places. Look with me at chapter 3 of this very letter, John 3, 24. John says, Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know he abides in us and by the Spirit whom he's given us. It's another great reminder that helps us climb into this fact. When God gives us new birth, if you missed last week's sermon, it's on our podcast, on our website. I encourage you to get it. It's the opening verse of chapter 5 and very foundational for what we're now working with in chapter 2 and 3 and beyond. We talked about what is new birth, how essential it is that what is dead and depraved must be made alive by God to see our sin and trust Jesus with our lives. It's when God gives us new birth, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, comes on board to invigorate our soul spiritually. We didn't have that. And what we also gain in that is motivations to not live according to the flesh anymore, but to live according to what honors God. Motivations I didn't have without the Spirit. Right? When I was dead in sin, that's all I did was sin. Even the good I did was sin, Scripture says. It wasn't under the glory of God. But what's cool is the Spirit doesn't just motivate us to obey God. Spirit causes us to motivate God, to, to obey God. And, and there's a sweet place we see this in Holy Scripture, and that's back in that pack, Old Testament passage in Ezekiel, chapter 36, 26 through 27, where we have a wonderful definition of what new birth, spiritual birth looks like. Um, but pay, as I read it again to you right now, pay extra close attention to the concluding remarks what the spirit at work in the life of the believer means for new birth, but also for obedience. God says, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, to obey my commands. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. 
This is good news for us. Because when God regenerated your heart, according to Scripture, your longings began to change. And they continue to change, according to Scripture, that as sanctification continues, you become more and more holy, more and more mature in your faith. Those longings continue to be edified and to change. Your desire is to please the Lord. Apart from Christ, apart from new birth, your desire was only to please your flesh, to be the Lord of your own life consequence of the fall. It's a consequence of, of the curse on Adam and Eve that the, the woman would completely upset the apple cart and longing for the man's position and not submitting to her rightly and the man would grovel in, in his work and all the breakdown of what it means to be dead in sin. When the Spirit comes on board, the Holy Spirit is now actively at work every day changing my longings and my motivations that I want God to rule over me. I want His authority now. His commandments are not a burden to me. And notice that John is not saying do this. He's saying, he's not saying obey and then you'll have something out of it. He's saying your obedience to the commandments of God is the evidence that you are saved by God. It's the foundation of your certainty, according to the emphasis of today's passage. The true Christian will joyfully submit to God and remain or abide in Him forever. Why? Because his or her heart has been changed by God. The good tree, according to Scripture, cannot produce a lasting crop of bad fruit. If it does, it proves to not be a good tree. So John says clearly here in verse 3, 1 John 5, 3, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. John, who wrote the Gospel of John much earlier in your Bible, in the early part of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels are the accounts of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. The narrative of what happened, his teachings and the occurrences around that. In John's writing of the gospel account, he quotes Jesus in his teaching in chapter 14, John 14. Here is Jesus' words, Jesus' teaching to the disciples. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. John 14, 15. He said it again this way in John 14, 21. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. If you love Jesus, you will not just love him as Savior, as the one who gets you out of hell. You will love him as Lord as well. You will... Love him as the one who now rules over your life in all of his perfect ways. The problem is that many misguided or misinformed people are quick to say, we don't really need to take God's commandments that seriously. And as outlandish as me saying that, that simply sounds to you, you actually might relate to it a little more than you realize you do in any of the things that God makes clear in Scripture that you've decided to do your own way. All too many people, many so-called Christians, say they, say they love Jesus, but they essentially live their lives ignorant or in denial of the things that He's made clear they are to do or not to do. Church, this cannot be. Jesus said clearly, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. God's laws and God's commands are so good for us that they are truly good and beautiful and worthy to be followed, trusted. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Listen to the, uh, this theologian's quote regarding that verse, that statement of Christ. This gentleman says, how this verse rebukes the increasing antinomianism of our day. I'm going to define that for you in a moment. 
In some circles, one cannot use the word commandments without being frowned upon as a legalist. Multitudes are now being taught that law is the enemy of grace and that the God of Sinai, the God of the Old Testament, is a stern and forbidding deity laying on his creatures a yoke of grievous to be born. Terrible travesty of the truth this is, he says. The one who wrote upon the tables of stone is none other than the one who died on Calvary's cross. He who here says, if ye love me, keep my commandments. And also said at Sinai, he would show mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Now maybe some of the language there tips the hand a little bit to reveal. The early parts of me reading that, you quickly go, that seems to be, was that a blog that I read yesterday? Right? But that was written by A.W. Pink a hundred years ago. And so it just shows how potent sin is. The sin of mankind, of to, to have the audacity to want to rewrite what the Lord makes clear is good or not good, that we are to do or not to do. We have the audacity to repackage or reprioritize what God makes clear in His written authoritative word to us. Now hear me clearly, in case maybe you're newer and to our church and you're going, okay, is this a very legalistic church? And let, let me state clearly the historic doctrines of grace. We are saved by grace alone. Through faith alone. In Christ alone. And not by any measure of our own will or works. This is true. But it also doesn't mean that the universal commandments, the moral law of God, the new covenant positive laws of God are not for us to obey after salvation. Because they are. We are to obey the Lord's commands, commandments. The good news, church, is that now we have the power and the desire to obey. When, when I was enslaved to my sin, I had none of that. In Christ alone is this possible. And when it's at work, it's a great evidence of our salvation. Now, I mentioned a moment ago, Pink mentions a big theological wor word that might be newer to you. It's the word antinomianism. Let me just quickly define that. It comes from two Greek words. Anti, meaning against. Nomos, meaning law. Antinomianism are those who are against the law. Theologically, antinomianism is the belief that God doesn't have standing commands on his people. Or that commands from God maybe exist, but that they're not very important to the Christian to obey them. And so here's the logic that feeds the heresy of antinomianism. People wrongly think, if I'm saved by grace... All my sins are forgiven, so why is it a concern then if I sin or not or follow the commands of God at all? It's all grace. And that thinking is not the proper response of true conversion because true conversion, true salvation, produces a genuine and ever-increasing desire to obey God's commands. It is the Spirit of God in us that brings about conviction, a true desire to submit to God and no longer our own flesh. There's a nuance here that I really want to make sure you get. The result of regeneration means the sovereign God gives us a new heart, new desires. The tree of life will go on to produce good and growing crop of God-honoring fruit and obedience. That doesn't mean perfection. It doesn't mean the Christian won't have days or even seasons of really struggling in sin. A true Christian will struggle. A true Christian will sin. A true Christian can even do grievous sin. 
A true Christian can languish in seasons of real immaturity. The difference between a true Christian and a superficial, not saved person claiming to be a Christian is the true Christian will not stay there. They will confess their sin. They will repent of it. They will grow out of that struggle or season as they move forward in Christ. There will be real production of God-honoring fruit. A real trajectory of growing sanctification. Even with the struggles and stretches of life where there is real backsliding, there is a true upward trajectory of sanctification. And here's why. Scripture is clear. God keeps those whom he saved. It is a modern, misguided, false reading of the Holy Bible to think that someone can have salvation and then work their way out of it. That somehow God's batting average is not a thousand percent. It's not biblical. All of those whom he's given to the Son, he keeps, has, secures them. So, this is helpful too. But we must be aware of antinomian thinking and doctrine infecting our, our minds, our lives, our families, or even the church. Let me show you how this can play out. Antinomianism can play out in the modern church or in modern Christianity. Let's say someone you know who is a professing Christian is seen or caught in sin and you faithfully love that person to call their sin out, to reorient them to the gospel, to walk with them, to call them to repent and trust and obey God. That is, according to Scripture, the loving thing to do for a fellow believer. But then another person says, whoa, who are you to say that, to do that? And they'll say, where is your grace? You, you have no position to judge them. Just pulling out of context verses as well. Church, all that kind of thinking is rooted in a misapplied antinomian fashion that has infected, again, a lot of modern people's thinking. It, we are saved by grace alone, but the evidence of the saved is desire and doing of the will and commands of God. Jesus is clear. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. It is not loving God to disregard God's commands, to not heed the authority of Scripture over your life. And it is also not loving the person to watch a professing Christian continue to walk in unrepentant sin. These are ideas fueled by bad teaching and misguided churches or people's own just constructed view of how the law and grace work. A helpful point to consider is this. You cannot love Jesus and disregard the fact that he is God. To, to know that he is God and to love him means you will submit to him. Why? Because he's God. And yet somehow a lot of modern Christians, again, we're so guilty of pulling God down. We want to soften him. We want to. And so we have this thing. We're like, yeah, I believe. And, and, and he saved me. And it's like, but he's God. <laughs> To say you love God means you love to be ruled by him. To love Jesus is to love his rule, to love his authority in your life, which means you will keep his commandments. Percy Haywards, another Bible scholar of the late 1800s, early 1900s, a Christian contemporary of A.W. Pink, who I read earlier, J.C. Ryle, he, he says this well. I've read it to some of you before, but... Selfful. He says, all sentimental talking or singing about love are vain, unless by grace we show a truthful obedience. 
There is more hypocrisy than we suppose. Love is practical or it's not love at all. Now, please note, he says, by grace we show truthful obedience, right? We don't, we don't obey, we don't do any of this without the grace of God, the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us. Praise God. We obey because we're redeemed, because we are given the power of the Holy Spirit. We're given a new heart for God. The evidence of our new birth in Christ is a true love for God and therefore a true obedience of His commandments and His word. Church, your desire must be to obey God, and this is not to be a burden on you. It's meant to be a joy, a true joy. That you rejoice that you are not left to your old, failed way. You get to know God. You get to know His good ways and commands. And you rejoice in this. Why? Because God is perfect. His ways are perfect. You know Him. and You know His statutes. You know His word. That is such a blessing. Any part of that that's made clear that you want to make war with, that you want to reject, that you want to set aside, I mean, that's only your flesh to call what is perfectly good. Ah, I don't want to do that. And so in that, we make it so much about us. Don't make it about you. Don't make it about what you want. Don't make it about what you don't have. You want him to rule over you. His commandments are not a burden. His ways are best. You trust him. That's what your faith in him is. Jesus modeled this perfectly. Jesus was without sin. God the Son, eternal in every way, took on flesh and lived his life in obedience to the Father. He said in John 8, 29, I always do the things that are pleasing to him. And, and, and Jesus loves us so well in his famous teaching in Matthew 7, 24 through 27. You're going to recognize this, but hear it fresh this morning. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And when the rains fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat down that house, it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them is like the foolish man who builds his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. I just want to ask you, how serious are you about obeying the commandments of God? Because there are likely some areas where we've come to know Scripture to speak clearly on an issue, and we've found a way to get busy and set it aside. Repackage it in our own ways. We choose to digest it so that I can feel good about what I'm choosing to do. Instead of just genuinely desire to do it his way and not his way rewrapped in my way. And for some of you, those crossroads are major. To be faithful to a covenant of marriage until death do you part when your spouse has completely abandoned you or is serving time in jail or whatever is going on. To Be honest in the stewardship of your money when finances are incredibly hard. You choose to be upright and to do what's honoring to God. To stand up for truth amidst your most precious family members, even if it means that relationship ends, they hate you. Some of those crossroads are really hard. 
And while the commands of God, the ways of God are so good, they're perfect, doesn't mean that the road in obeying them are easy. Sometimes they're very costly, very hard. But they are good. They are right. (laughs) How foolish we are. Jesus uses the word to disregard what he makes clear and say, I'm going to just do this my way. I mean, don't we do that? We, we see situations pretty clear about it. Like, no, but it, man, that's going to cost so much. It's take way too long. I don't, can't, I can't. We, we say that all the time. I'm just going to do it this way. I'm gonna, we're going to go this route. Hey, it's going to be so much better. Be quick. And just guilty of some real manipulation of a relationship that we say we take most seriously. I'm just going to do it real quick. And I know it's not what God tells me I should do, but man, it's going to be so good. And who I know will forgive me. That's not you loving God. That's you loving yourself. That's you being Lord of your own life. You say, how, pastor? How can I do it? I, I just don't think I can. And, and that's a good point. You can't. You, you can Right? I'm trying to remind you of that. You can't. Christ in you can. You're desperate for him. You're not being commanded to do it on your own. Christ in you can. He'll give you all that you need to endure until he calls you home. How do we know what God wants us to do? If we're going to obey his commandments, we've got to pause here and think about this for a second. It's a really important question that often is also very manipulated. How do I know what God wants me to do? I'll hear Christians say, God is telling me, or I'll hear Christians say, God is leading me, or hear them say, God is pressing upon me. And I think there is a biblical way that all that can be true. I also think there's a way that it's often not true. We'll be careful that we're looking at that rightly. And so here's how we test it. God tells us all he wants us to know, according to Scripture, in his word. God speaks to us through the faithful preaching of his word, through our faithful study of his word, and through the work of the Holy Spirit to draw to our memory his word. When you are thinking like I'm feeling the Lord pressing this, all that is is the work of the Holy Spirit to remind you of what He has blessed you with in His Word. He's never giving you new revelation there. It's very unbiblical way to think about it. God speaks to us faithfully in these ways in the Word. He's not telling you something that is outside of His Word. He's not bringing you new revelation. Nor should you be looking for new revelation. Here's why. I'm not telling you that on my own opinion. Why don't we need a new word? Because of what his word tells us. All scripture is breathed out by God. And is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness that the man of God may have most of what he needs to know, but when it comes to some things, he's going to be lacking. No, right? So let's not add that to the text because that's the way sometimes we're guilty of thinking about it. That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. You don't need a different word. You don't need a new word. You have all that you need by the perfect and holy God in the holy word. 2 Timothy three sixteen and 17. In other words, All that God has ordained to tell us that we need for teaching, for our reproof, for our correction, for our training and growing in righteousness, making the saved person complete and fully equipped is found in Holy Scripture. Scripture is clear to warn us that there's nothing that needs to be added to that which has already been clearly preached and written by the prophets and the apostles. Church, we need, we know what to do and what not to do, because God has loved us well to make it clear in his written word. This is a great gift. 
By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. Consider that with me. His commandments are not burdensome. For many people, for many generations, religious commandments have been heavy burdens. Likely you relate to that statement somewhere in your journey. The rules of what you perceive to be related to any kind of religious instruction were heavy on you. They're impossible to meet. So heavy that many people refuse to submit to them, become miserable if they're trying to submit to them because they're never able to fulfill them. Constant in disappointment. So it's important that we, res- that we see why man-made religious commands feel like heavy burdens and why a misapplication um, of trying to fulfill God's good commands wrongly is also like a heavy burden. So let's break into it this way. Many of the rules we think we need to follow are not from God, they're from man. They are man-made, they are pharisaical, they are extra burdens. The regulations of the scribes and the Pharisees were heavy burdens to bear. Jesus spoke specifically to this, Matthew 23, 4. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, laying them on people's shoulders. They themselves are not willing to move a finger. Uh, Luke eleven forty six. 46. Woe to the lawyers also. You load people with heavy burdens, hard to bear. You yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. So this is why the elders of our historic church have efforted over the last 15 years to be faithful to attack any of the man-made stuff that we took on. Because it's not needed. We, we don't need the church to be God's way and man's way. We need it to be God's way. And so we had to begin to address man-made traditions and bad doctrine and bad practices of the church and all this, one by one, took a lot of years. If you're arriving today, you're arriving on the sweet end of a lot of work. By God's grace, we're here. We don't value man-made traditions or rules. We value and obey God's commands as we understand them from Holy Scripture. So many of you your, your story relates to the heavy burden of religious commandments on you because you grew up in a Roman Catholic environment who is staunchly guilty of adding tons of rules to Holy Scripture so that they can control the whole thing. The Reformers died for generations to call it out. We stand on the life, work, death of many faithful ones who said, here's what it is to be committed to Scripture alone and not also to these added things that the church has put in place. Some of you maybe grew up in Jehovah's Witness, or you grew up Mormon, you grew up Pentecostal oneness, or maybe just uber-technical, legalistic churches that just had a lot of stuff. Or even churches that were really great on in so many ways, but were guilty of a lot of man-made ways of doing stuff. Please understand that. We talk about righteous obedience to God's law and commands. We're not ever talking about extra-biblical traditions or rules, because these, according to Scripture, are only heavy burdens on you. Praise God that we have so many here who have come to know the sweet blessing of what it is to be under the authority of God and His Word alone and no longer to be weighed down by the traditions and rules of man-made religions, beliefs. So when you think His ways are not burdensome, that's the first thing. you got to separate all the stuff that you thought were like things you have to be doing that are extra-biblical. Number two, you 
Commands are heavy and not light when we try to fulfill God's good commands outside of Christ. We cannot fulfill them on our own. You will not fulfill the commands of God without Jesus. You cannot fulfill the law on your own. You need the power of the Lord. You need the work of the Spirit to make God's commands, first of all, sweet, something to be desired, to be motivated to do them, to be faithful to it. You, just, you won't do that in your flesh alone. So this is why Jesus loves us well when he says things like in Matthew eleven thirty, 30, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That, that, that yoke, that wooden frame to bind together two animals to be connected, to, to bear the load together, to be yoked to Christ is to have his help to fulfill what is needed to be done. To not be yoked to Christ. To be yoked to anything else is to carry an unbelievable amount of weight that you will not be able to bear. Some people have read that, my yoke is light, my um, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Some people have read that to be like, what Jesus is saying there is like life with Christ, prosperity, gospel, nonsense. It's just easy street. This is my burden. Commandments. No, there's still things to do. There's still a life to live. There's still suffering that we partner with Christ in. Jesus died to save you from hell, not to save you from the cross. That's Christianity according to Scripture. Paul is going to agree with Christ in, in this emphasis at, at the critical turning point of his letter to the Romans, chapter 12, verse 2, Paul says, Do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. He's not just saying, like with self help books, just think differently. <laughs> the transforming of your mind. Uh, is the work of God to save you. That's really all the 11 chapters of Romans up until that point. Now because you have that work within you, you're abiding by the word, you know the truth, you, you're able to know the will of God. And what is the will of God? I love this. Don't miss this. His will for you, his commandments on you, are good, acceptable, perfect, So when we're yoked to Jesus, when when we're renewed in our mind by the Spirit, then the will of God, the commands of God are good, they're acceptable, they're perfect. Church, I, I want you to see that God's ways, His commands, His will is so good. and it, It's not only good, it's best. It's not only best, it's perfect. And so when we're in that moment, we're thinking, ah, yeah, okay, but I'm just still going to do this thing my way. We're just we're missing it. And we're not loving God in that moment. I, I want us to have a different view of the commandments of the Lord, the law of the Lord, the word of the Lord. And so to help us with that, God's blessed us with his servant David, with the psalmist. Hear, hear David's heart in the beautiful spot in the Psalms, chapter 19, 7 through 11. Maybe you can just close your eyes and just hear me read it. Here's his song. Here's his proclamation. David says, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The command of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, Enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey, the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. God's commands are good, church. 
And when we're yoked to Christ and empowered by the Spirit, His commands will not be a burden to us. They will be a true blessing to us. An illustration I've used in the past, I'll share it with you, I shared it with the first hour, came to mind. And, and now, let me be clear, I'm going to give you an illustration of warning that's not the perfection of God's holy word and command to us. So I'm not trying to level the two, but I want to make a point. And that is, you've waited all year to finally get out of this Bakersfield Valley and get to the beach with the kids, the grandkids, to feel the ocean, the salt, and get in the water and cool down. And so you, you're there, and, and like my family probably, there, there, see the beach? Oh, we're almost there. And then there, there's the sand. Oh, the sand's hot. Okay. And, and, and here's our spot. Look how amazing it is. I can't wait to get in. And there's this big sign there that says, no swimming, sharks in the water. And you're just... And you look at the kids like, well, I guess it's sandcastles today. And we're going home. And, you know, they look back at you. Hey, we could make sandcastles in the hot sand in Bakersfield. We come here for, for the water, for the ocean. That's what's not in Bakersfield, right? And there's a way that that good warning could, could just, you could just be deflated. And everyone's miserable and grumpy and groaning and how terrible. How was your trip? It was terrible. We didn't get to go in the ocean and blah, blah, blah. And all these things. How terrible, how terrible. And I'm down and I'm low and I hate it. And, or... You can rejoice that you were loved and warned that sharks were in the water so that your testimony at the end of that day was not woeful tears that your spouse and your three kids and their friends all got ripped apart by sharks. There could be a real rejoicing in you. What a blessing that I was loved and warned rightly and my family was kept from great harm. We enjoyed the sand and the beach and the cool air, and God is good. What we read from David here is rejoicing, seeing the blessing that his commandments, his ways are. Do you see them this way? I pray you do. I pray that when you are at a crossroad and you're considering appeasing the flesh or the, the fear of man to, to do what someone else wants you to do or the rationale of your own mind instead of trusting God's good revealed will, command for you, you really stop and remember, his ways are good. My ways are dumb. Really, Right? I think most of us in the room have been old enough to look back and see a lot of stuff that's like, no, I'm so glad that didn't go the way I wanted it to, or it's so regretful it went the way I thought it would be best. His ways might be really hard sometimes. Fulfilling his commandments might be very costly. But they're the right thing to do. They're the better thing to do. They're the God-honoring thing to do. You know when the commandments of the Lord become burdensome for us? Is when I'm really just really more interested in serving my own will. When I give way to my flesh, my sin, my, my emotions. I set Christ aside. When I stop abiding in his good truths. That's when I listened to the deception. A young man came up to me after first hour and asked, said, Pastor, how do I really, really fight off some of the temptation knocking on my door? And really do what God's telling me to do and not give in. You've got to be abiding in the truths of the word. Are you, are you abiding in it every day? Why? You need to be reminding your heart and your soul what is true. Because the, the world and the enemy is land blasting you. It's just full front assault of deception and lies. You've got to be equipped to combat that. No, that's nonsense. That's, I know you're selling that as really good, but I ain't buying. I'm secure in the Lord. I'm walking with the body. I'm accountable to other brothers and sisters so that, you know, I said, don't go at this alone. Don't walk the, the valley of the shadow of death alone. 
You press into Christ and his word and prayer, and you walk with the body he saved you to. If you're a lone ranger and you call yourself a Christian, you're doing it all wrong. God has saved you out of individuality to the family of God, to have shepherds to look out for you and teach you rightly, to have a body of Christ to walk with and know you. I said, you're a soldier. I told that young man, you're a soldier with knights at your round table. Don't be a no man. A Christian has real plurality in their lives to protect and to be accountable to. Maybe it's time to start really walking with those men. Maybe it's time to finally share what you haven't shared yet. Maybe it's time to really heed their counsel and do finally what they've said, continuing to try to reprogram, and then I got this, while you keep falling on your face. He was really encouraged. I'm speaking to you more firmly than I spoke to him. God's commands are good for us, church. But we need to be very careful to not be more interested in fulfilling our own will. It's only then, when I'm focused on myself, on my own priorities, on my own agenda, that I begin to despise God's. When I count what he's calling me to do a burden. When we're rightly focused on treasuring Jesus as the great thing, greatest thing of our lives, as sufficient, as praiseworthy, then we will keep his commands and we will not despise them. So a way I want to give you to think about this as we prepare to wrap up this morning. We've got to look to the Savior. We have to look to Jesus. We have to know him rightly. We have to trust him. And we have to see the kind of king he is. See, Jesus is not just a king on a throne. If left, if, if you think of him only that way, then you will maybe submit to him begrudgingly, lifelessly. Some of you, if you're really honest, you're even at church today because you have to be according to someone. Not because it's your first priority, not because it's your joy to prepare for Saturday night in the week and wake up on Sunday morning and be with the saints to worship the king, grow in his word. No, because you have to be. You're, some of you resent having to appease your family to attend church. If it was up to you, you'd be doing something different with your weekend. And if you relate to this, and let me just talk to you for a moment. If you feel like Jesus is just a king on a throne, an authority you have to submit to, then you're missing the beauty of the gospel that causes you to look at him completely different. You're missing the utter joy it is in Christ to belong to him, to call him master, that it's your joy to be his slave, to serve him all of your days. But for some of you, Christianity, the thought of Jesus' rule, God's rule in your life is like a nagging boss. And if that's what it is, then you don't see, you don't have a relationship with him. Your love for him is not authentic. It's contrived out of some kind of religious obligation. If all you see in Jesus is religion, if all you see is orders coming down from the boss that you have to submit to, then you're missing the power of the gospel to give you a whole different approach. So hear this. Jesus is not only a king, he's the king. The king of kings. And yet, in all of his unmatched authority, he went very low. He got low. He humbled himself to take on flesh, to die on a murderer's cross, to save an, an incredibly undeserving people. He's a king who came not to be served, but to serve and to give up his life as a ransom for many. You need to know him this way. You need to know the beauty of the gospel, God's love and grace, 
through the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. If Jesus to you is only the means to an end, then you don't love Jesus, nor will you joyfully obey him. Why? Because you still live for something else. You're still an idolater. You only love what he gets you. If Jesus is the Lord of your life, though, if he is your joy, if he is your identity, then he won't just be a king, he'll be your king. And it will be your utter privilege in your life to serve him, to live for him. And then you won't come to him with your own desires and ideas of how this should transpire. You won't be guilty in sin of saying, God, how dare you? No, it's his. It all belongs to him. Everything you have, everything you are belongs to him. It's your joy to serve him. He's bought you at the high price. So I don't hold my family. I don't hold my personal interest against him and demand that he does what I want. No, I lay down my agenda. So much so that I look to him and I say, command me. If Jesus is the true joy of your heart, the great affection of your love in life, you will do what Jesus is telling you to do today and ongoingly. You will obey his commands. You will keep his word. He will be the one who defines your value, who gives you identity. He will be the one for whom you live and worship. He will be your greatest love. And again, then he won't just be a king on the throne. He'll be your king. I pray that God redeems your cold, selfish heart to give you new birth, to help you see your sin, that you would confess that sin and trust your life to Jesus to be saved, to be reborn, to know his love and then to share that love, to have the desire, the spirit in you to fulfill the commands of the Lord, that those commands would not be burdensome to you. If Jesus truly becomes your Savior, then according to Scripture, he becomes your Lord. Understand that the life of a true child of God is one who has died to self and now lives to Christ. It's a, it's a person whose prideful neck has been broken, whose worldly affections have been shattered, whose stony heart has been crushed, whose life is now mastered by Jesus. It's the one who says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Amen? 1 John 5, 2-3 By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. Pray with me. Father, I thank you for this sweet time together to um, be a part of this. The work you've done in me throughout the week in prayer and study and enjoying this text and all of your good word. Um, the blessing it is to be here among the, your blood-bought people to, to worship you, to, to do business with things that we've maybe pridefully, ignorantly, sinfully put aside. And, and that's you loving us. That's your mercy to draw us to yourself, to, to remind us that your ways are good, that we would put down all of our deadly doing and all of our prideful agendas, and we would just truly, joyfully grow in Christ and sanctification unto obeying you. And the evidences of these works in our lives would be a great certainty to us. Um, be, a, be at work in and through us, Lord, so that the light of the gospel is at work in those that are in our path. And more than anything, Lord, be glorified. Because all of it, all of who we are, all that we have, all glory be to Christ. All glory be to Christ, our King. In Jesus' name we pray.